Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. Today, we have a cross-country reaction from the most recent gathering of the FCM in Ottawa for Advocacy Days. Then we will head to the Northwest Territories to get reaction on this month's territorial election and what the Northwest Territory Association of Communities is looking for from their next government. Then we will head to Manitoba with a reaction from the Association of Manitoba Municipalities on the first speech from the throne from the Manitoba government. Then finally, we will chat with two former council candidates in the city of Calgary and discuss their views on the potential entrance of municipal political parties at the municipal level. But first, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities concluded its successful annual Advocacy Days, a crucial forum that brought together Canada's local leaders with their federal counterparts. Held in Ottawa from November 21st to 24th, this event facilitated over 100 advocacy meetings between municipal leaders and members of parliament spanning across government and opposition benches. The primary focus of these meetings was on key municipal priorities, including housing and homelessness, investment in community infrastructure, and the imperative for a new municipal growth framework. Distinguished figures such as Federal Minister of Housing, Infrastructure, and Communities of Canada, Sean Fraser, Shadow Minister for Housing and Diversity and Inclusion, Scott Aitchinson, and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh delivered keynote addresses during the advocacy days to the members in attendance. Their insightful contributions to the substantial discussion surrounding crucial issues facing Canadian municipalities was heard. This year's advocacy days concluded coincided with the release of the Federal Fall Economic Statement. FCM responded comprehensively to the statement expressing appreciation for certain measures aimed at improving housing affordability. However, the organization voiced concerns about the insufficient infrastructure investment that remains a pressing need for their communities across the country. FCM President Scott Pierce highlighted the importance of this edition of the Advocacy Days, stating, quote, Throughout the week, in meetings with parliamentarians from all major federal parties, we have advocated clearly and with urgency for what is needed right now, support to help tackle the shared issues that our communities are facing, end quote. Now, a key theme underscored during the event was the imperative to bridge the gap between the ambitious federal housing targets of 5.8 million new homes by 2030 and the current state of infrastructure provisions. New research commissioned by FCM emphasized this gap, revealing that the average cost of municipal infrastructure to support each new home is approximately $107,000 each. This stark infrastructure investment gap demands immediate attention, highlighting the interconnected nature of Canada's housing and infrastructure challenges. President Pierce, alongside Mike Savage, the chair of FCM's Big City Mayor's Caucus and Mayor of Halifax, unveiled this research at a press conference that week. The findings underscored the urgent need for action to address the infrastructure challenges accompanying the Canada's housing crisis. During its meeting, FCM Board of Directors reiterated expectations for Budget 2024 as well, calling for new federal investments in infrastructure and a commitment to convene a national conversation among various levels of government. This dialogue aims to lay the groundwork for federal, provincial, territorial, municipal negotiations, leading to a modernized municipal growth framework that effectively addresses the evolving needs of Canadians in growing communities. Now, we sat down with Yellowknife Mayor Rebecca Alte regarding the most recent Advocacy Days in Ottawa and what she heard from federal parliamentarians. Um, you met with uh, parliamentary MPs from across the political spectrum. Uh, how were those conversations? Good. And uh, um, a lot of discussion about housing and infrastructure and how interconnected they are and how we need to not 
just put all the money into building a house because again if you build a house it's it needs water as well it's it's something you know heaven forbid we ask for um and so some really good discussions getting some the the ball rolling on discussions about modernizing our our finance and um since the Canada Community Building Fund is up for renewal this year really making sure that that it's it's clear how important if we want to build six million new homes in Canada, we need an infrastructure plan that supports that. So not just dollars for houses, but dollars for the roads, water, and sewer that all those houses are going to need as well. It seems, and just this is just me being me right now, and this is not the opinion of the mayor, this is the opinion of the host. It seems like a lot of the attention right now are focused on a lot of the larger urban centers in some of these southern areas when you were speaking to uh, MPs in Ottawa were they wanting to have this conversation with you as the mayor of a sort of urban uh, urban rural northern community for sure I would specifically get asked to be included in certain meetings because they wanted to make sure that there was a, a northern and a rural remote voice there and so that it wasn't just um you know the big city mayor's caucus talking so you know the i would say not only the federal government the liberals um but also meeting with the ndp and the conservatives was to make sure that you know programs being rolled out or policies that are being recommended that are going to work for um the rest of Canada and not just those those big cities and a lot of that we say is about for the funding to be allocation and not application based because that's where us small rural remote communities and you know I think of myself as small being the city of Yellowknife 22,000 um, but then talking to some of the the smaller places and they're like we have a staff of two city manager and the guy that cuts the grass in the the summer. And I'm like, Oh, that's small. Uh, so like, there's just, there's not a chance that they're going to be able to apply for this funding. There's, they still have the needs like we do, but um, that's where we're like really encouraging them to go with more of the, the allocation model to, to recognize that. On November 14th, residents in the Northwest Territories casted their votes to elect new members of the Legislative Assembly. Now, it's crucial to note that the territorial government operates under a consensus government system where all MLAs serve as independents without affiliation to any political parties. Notably, the Premier and Cabinet members are elected by fellow MLAs, not by residents of the territory. Now, in the coming days, the recently sworn in MLAs will convene to elect a new premier and cabinet. This elected leadership will be tasked with the focus of reconstruction after this summer's wildfires and addressing the needs for all residents within the territory. Last week, we had the opportunity to sit down with Yellowknife Mayor Rebecca Alte, who also holds the position of president of the Northwest Territorial Association of Communities. Our conversation centered around the latest territorial election, exploring Mayor Alte's perspectives on the outcomes, and delving into key areas she envisions the next government prioritizes in the upcoming term. Mayor Alti, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, I want to start with your general reaction as mayor of the city of Yellowknife, but also as the president of the Northwest Territories Association of Communities on the election on November 14th of the new Legislative Assembly for the uh, territory of the Northwest Territories. From a municipal perspective, I think it's one of the first times in... A long time, if ever, that we've had so many former municipal colleagues now in uh, the House. And so six that I know of um, are either former mayors, councillors or city managers. And so just being able to to not have to explain to our colleagues at the territorial level, like, municipal governments have to have balanced budgets. And if we want to borrow, we've you know, got to go to out to a referendum. I think we're able to to get past those um, background information sessions and really dive into some of those meaty topics. Uh, so I am hoping that those six are then able to 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 communicate to the rest of their colleagues. You know, the intricacies of municipalities and 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 really how much 
uh, control the territorial government has through legislation on on what happens at the municipal level. Now, during the election on November 1st, because I had to make sure I got the exact date here, you posted something on your social media on Facebook uh, calling on the uh, candidates, the then candidates, so some of them uh, were unsuccessful who filled out the survey, but uh, you asked them to make some pledges to communities. And I want to quote a little bit of that and get your reaction on where this goes from here now. And in your open letter on the social media, you posted, in addition, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, over the years, there have been small increases, but no impl implementation plan to close the underfunding gap. You've just mentioned, uh, you say six, I look at seven because I do account the former chief and band council member as one of those seven members. Um, are you hopeful that these MLAs elects, because they have not officially been sworn in yet, will have that perspective of hopefully bridging that gap between communities and the territorial government? I am. Uh, I always have to be hopeful. That's, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, but not only, you know, I, I'm hoping that the municipal level, the territorial and the federal government, you know, I'm also on the board of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And that's what we've spent the, the past week really talking about. We're, we're down here in Ottawa. Um, is about getting together those three orders of government and talking about um, how do we move forward in financing and of our communities because the property tax system was built in the 1900s and and now we're dealing with 2023 problems and um, so it, it it's not working so not only the the municipal funding gap and hoping that the federal government and the territorial government negotiate a good deal for for communities through the Canada Community Community Building Fund for the next ten years, um, but at the territorial level, also really hoping that they'll they'll dive into the Property Assessment and Taxation Act, which is something that we've been calling on them to review and modernize for a number of years. And uh, yeah, just this past week in Ottawa, talking to colleagues from across the country, there's a variety of of different ways that municipal governments are trying to generate revenue in a more progressive and modern way. And for example, uh, Quebec's looking at potentially having different property tax brackets for properties that similar to what we have at the income tax level. So, you know, it's not only about increasing our budget, but also giving us the tools to be able to, to generate more or different revenue. This election saw uh, sort of a big change in the legislative assembly. We had a few retirements, a few incumbents, uh, unfortunately defeated or uh, fortunately defeated for those who actually did get elected over top of them. And relatively a lot of newcomers to this, uh, the, their positions as MLAs. But communities like Yellowknife uh, and the countless communities across the territory aren't stopping. You still have pressing issues that are uh, top of mind for you. We talk about the forest fires uh, that happened earlier this year. This government, the, the, the premier is going to be selected or elected uh, this week, uh, next week cabinet, or potentially a little bit early sooner. Um, you as a mayor and as the president can't stop though. How do you work in this transitional period until this new premier, until the new cabinet is sworn in. And then you understand that you have a lot to sort of catch them up on because your job is not stopping while the, they're waiting for their election. Yeah. And uh, recognizing that we almost, it, we didn't wait for them to get elected. We started the the education beforehand. And so not only did we, we send those questions out, which is kind of getting the wheels turning on, oh, these are some issues that are going to be coming at me in the next term. Um, we also, through the NWTA Association of Communities, we held um, sessions with candidates to, to get their feedback and an opportunity to have those discussions about what the reality is on the ground for municipalities. So started that before the election. Um, and now that they're elected, we are looking to to meet with them. Um, still working on a date to meet with all the MLAs as the NWT Association of Communities. And then uh, Yellowknife MLAs, City Council and Yellowknife MLAs, we're looking to meet with them too. Um, because there's that, that fine window where there, it's a lot of information by a fire hose. Um, 
but you kind of want to get in there before priorities get set. Cause once the priorities set, if you're not, not in that list, it's, it's harder and harder, you know, kind of pushing a rock up, up the hill. While there's no uh, official word on who the next premier will be, because there's three names that have been floated around as potential new premiers, what is the NWAC, NWTCA looking for from the next premier in concrete action when it comes to their relationship with the uh, communities of the uh, territory? What we are hoping to to have is is more partnership and opportunities to work together, and so not waiting until you know, an emergency hits, whether that's literally with a, a pandemic or a forest fire, but um, some of the, the figurative deadlines, uh, you know, the federal government's boom, releasing rapid housing, we need to get an application and we need the, the territorial government to come in with o and uh, operations and maintenance dollars. Um, so really being able to have more of the proactive and um, we've had good working relationships with the Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs. Uh, but again, municipalities are in the modern modern space are dealing with economic development where we're, you know, getting into the social space. And so that's where we see the opportunity to have that relationship with the premier, since community governments are no longer just one department. It's we're really engaging with so many different departments. So really hoping to be able to to form a, a good working relationship with the premier as well as the, the rest of the cabinet. Well, I, I don't want to ask the political question, but I'm going to kind of have to. Is there a candidate that you're looking at more than the others right now? Or are you just hoping that whoever the next premier is will sit down with you the moment or week after or a few weeks after they're, they're sworn in and have that frank discussion that we've talked about so far? Yeah, I think the the benefit is the three names that you've said are floating around have all been on the past cabinet. And so we have good working relationships with all three. You know, um, Shane Thompson was formerly the Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs, so we had regular engagement with him. Um, Carolyn Wozniak was the Minister of Finance, so was working well with her. Um, and then RJ Simpson, uh, dominantly through his education, culture and employment hat, his education hat was working with him, whether it was on post-secondary or the, the JK to K, so, or JK to 12. So um, yeah, we, we've got a good working relationship with them all and really looking to, to build on that, whoever the premier is. And, I, you know, tough to say if the rest would make it into cabinet, um, but would look to work with them there too. Are you lo are you more interested on who the next premier is or who the next minister of municipal affairs will be? Because that is the person you'll probably be dealing with a little bit more than the premier. But are you looking at both elections right now? Or are you sort of focusing on see who the next premier is? Because then you could tell where their sort of vision for the territory is going to be going. Yeah, I, I guess I would say both. And uh, the minister of housing, since that's such a big, uh, you know, historically, the Minister of Housing has been this rinky-dink uh, kind of junior portfolio. That's a, a, a up and uh, first term minister. Here you go. Here's housing. And it's like, this is our most pressing need. I want the best candidate to be leading this file. So, um, and, and same with municipal and community affairs has been kind of like, Ah, this is an easy portfolio where I think we really need a strong advocate to uh, to make those to make those pitches to make the lobbying when it comes to the the finance and the budgeting um, because you can't build housing if you don't have the water and sewer infrastructure to to support them and so you know on on one hand I think it's definitely something in Canada we forget about you turn on your taps you expect water to come out. Um, you can't see what's happening underground so it's it it's definitely a concern and it's we want to be we want to be able to uh keep up with our regular maintenance as opposed to getting to this dire situation where a main heaven forbid blows and it's a really expensive fix you're the the association is made up of communities across the territory large and small um this means that those issues that we're talking about are going to be different in each one of these communities 
how do you see your role as president in addressing these issues with this new uh, government when they are sort of trying to play catch up with that fire hose as well? And you understand, and we've talked about it a little bit, but I want to know about the balancing act that all communities are treated fairly in this next uh, session of the legislature. It's definitely the thing that I um, try to clearly communicate to, you know, when we talk about the municipal underfunding, that's not just the yellow knife thing. And if you look at per capita, uh, it was the 2014 numbers. Um, I can't remember. They're no longer breaking it down by community. But uh, in 2014, Tuck was uh, dollars wise, not as underfunded as Yellowknife, but if you looked at per capita, it was grossly underfunded. And so whether it's a big community like Yellowknife or a small one, we're all feeling that, that, that pinch. Yellowknife does have a tax base that, you know, is, is stretched. We can't tax people to infinity to try to, to cover stuff, but, uh, the smaller communities, uh, don't have that that solution. So I would say we're all facing the same problem, but how to address it might be different. Um, same with when it comes to housing, you know, Yellowknife's got a private market we, that needs more housing. We also have all the, the non-market housing, the transitional housing that we need, the supportive housing. And then you have the smaller communities, which doesn't really have a market, um, any market housing, but so they need more in that non-market housing space. But at the end of the day, we all face the same problems. It's just, I'd say, slightly different ways to solve it for, for us all. I, I need you to put your hat on as mayor of the city of Yellowknife for a second, because two of your former colleagues, Shauna Morgan, the MLA elect, and Julian Morris, the MLA elect, were just recently elected on November 14th. You must be a little bit more at ease because you have a working relationship already prepared with these two. Um, does it give you a little bit of confidence that you, the Yellowknife issues are going to be addressed in this next legislature with these two strong voices at the table? wherever they end up, whether it be cabinet or just as an MLA. Yeah, yeah, no, for definitely for the municipal issues, I would say all of the Yellowknife MLAs are going to have that that strong voice. Um, not only for Yellowknife, though, I think that also recognizing that, um, you know, if you put all your eggs in one basket, uh, it, it's it's not going to work out. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful and I uh, think the, the seven Yellowknife MLAs Again, hoping to to be able to work together as a whole territory so that we can all all advance, you know, all of our, our boats rise. Last week, the newly elected NDP Manitoba government introduced its inaugural speech from the throne titled A New Day in Manitoba. Brad Salick, the president of the Association of Manitoba Municipalities and Reeve of the Rural Municipality of Brokenhead, was present in the chambers when Lieutenant Governor Anita Neville delivered the speech. Salick mentioned that the speech outlined the key priorities set by the association in the Let's Grow Manitoba Together campaign. The campaign focused on four pillars, funding fairness and predictability, investment in core infrastructure, investment in people, and public safety. Immediately after the speech, we spoke by phone with Reeve Salek to gather his reaction to the content and discuss his perspectives on the future working relationship with the province in light of the speech. Okay, Brad, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of the general consensus of what you heard today at the speech from the throne in Winnipeg. Uh, what did you hear? And was there anything that you take away from a municipal standpoint? Well, the, most of the throne speech was based on some of the uh, four pillars that we had brought forward to the government when they were going through the election. And we, we discussed this with all the parties that were running and in today's throne speech they covered on all four four of the pillar priorities except one of the things that we really didn't see much of or hear much of was a discussion of uh, water and wastewater projects for municipalities in manitoba they talked about uh, uh, escalator funding for municipalities in the future and they talked about sa uh, public safety plus uh, health health care which was major to us, but we still, we were very grateful that that was announced. But like I said, we have smaller municipalities that are suffering for water and wastewater projects and their municipalities are 
either going to die or would not be getting not not die but they need to thrive and they're not getting the dollars put towards them to to grow now this speech of the throne is an outline of what the government plans to do in its sitting and particularly the fall sitting and their first term in office you talk about the togetherness and i know uh, like you said ama launched their working together for all working uh, for manitoba together uh campaign during the election and this uh speech from the throne the word together came out a lot do you have faith that this government will be collaborating with municipalities on these issues that were outlined during the election and potentially work together on this wastewater and water uh, plan that you hopefully will see some movement on with this government? As an association, I think we're, we're pretty positive right now in dealing with this government. Yes, they are a newly elected government, but we've worked with them as an opposition government in the past and, you know, they know that we're an organization that are willing to come to the table and, and work together to make sure the Manitobans grow together. And I think this government has listened to us. Uh, it's like I said, it's a new government. We need time to process and there's new ministers in place and they need time to learn their roles. But I, I think all in all that this is uh, going to be a good working relationship with us. One of the key standouts for me when I was listening was the uh, mention of housing, addiction, and homelessness and working with municipalities to solve these issues locally. Um, what do you take away as the vice president of AMA, but also for your community as Reeve of the RM of Brokenhead? I got to correct you. It's AMM. Uh, AMM. Sorry, AMM. I apologize. <laughs> No, 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 no worries. Uh, you know what? I'm very fortunate that in our municipality, we don't have as many problems as there are with other uh, bigger municipalities or towns that have the addictions that are happening. I know it's probably something that's going to be coming to our municipality, but as an association, we, we have been listening to the bigger cities and, and uh, areas that are having problems with problems with housing and addictions. And we're we're trying to come together to try and strategize a plan to hopefully this will come to an end. But it's it's a it's a big file to work on. For communities like yours in rural Manitoba, did you see anything locally that you can take away? Because you talk about the larger urban centers. Dauphin, Brandon, Selkirk, Winnipeg were mentioned, but not a lot of the rural communities were mentioned. Are you concerned that this focus from this government municipally is going to be more urban than rural? I think we just need to address that issue with the government and tell them that, you know, there are other municipalities outside of these areas that need to be focused on. And like I said, it was mentioned in there, but I think we're, we're pretty proud that we've established to get multi-year funding for municipalities that we haven't had, uh, you know, since 2016, and we've been operating on 2016 dollars for many years. So I think that's one of the key takeaways. But I know that there were some of the bigger cities that were mentioned and and how they were going to work together. But I think we need to, like I said, revitalize some of the smaller communities because we have to make them grow as well. How how do you how do you see that working? How do you see that partnering with the province to ensure that happens? Because uh, I've been speaking to many of your members from across the province, and they're telling me different issues that are their concerns. This uh, speech from the throne outlined some key priorities for the province, but every individual municipality is going to have their own unique challenges and concerns when moving forward into 2024. How do you see as an organization working with all members? particularly larger or smaller to ensure that everyone has a voice when approaching this government? I think our association does quite well at that because, you know, we are one association, association that works for urban and rural members. And we, we cannot forget these small communities and the small communities have to grow as well. And we know that the bigger ones are, you know, somewhat some flourishing, but there's not the point that everyone is still working with old dollars and not, you know, we need to work together with this government. And like I said, it was it is a new government. And in the coming months, we're going to see how they react and how they perform. Uh, we have our convention next week, and we actually have a chance to sit down with the, the newly elected ministers 
and sit as a group and and discuss some of our issues that are happening through our membership. And yep. I think, you know, that's that's a that's the definite need here is to build a relationship up with these new ministers and to show them that there are other things and you know, the big city of Winnipeg and, and bigger cities that small municipalities can grow and need help as well. Were, were you happy that there was mention of public safety in this speech from the throne? Because you did mention it at the top of the interview. But what does it mean for you as Reeve, as the leader of your community, to have a government focused on public safety and potentially putting more mental health uh, workers on the ground to help with some of the challenges that are faced in some of these smaller urban, rural, sorry, smaller ur- rural communities? a great thing to have in place because our, our detachments are getting smaller and smaller. There's not as many members as, as there were and when I was growing up where we had 15 and 16 RCP members in our detachment. Today we have six and if we get too caught up on a, on having to do a, a transfer for a mental health issue, that could take up 24 to 48 hours of those members not being with boots on the ground term or spally. So having this come across is great for for Manitoba. It puts more of our members back on the road doing what they're supposed to be doing. I know that there's other municipalities that sometimes wait three to four hours for a, an RCMP officer to arrive. We're hoping that this can minimize some of that call time. I want to turn to another subject here for a quick second, if you don't mind. And that is, you just mentioned it, the upcoming AMM convention in Brandon. Uh, I, I've got to ask, are you prepared? Because you did just announce, uh, I believe today, that uh, Premier Wabkanu will be speaking at the convention. You, you just said that ministers will be there as well. Uh are your members looking forward to getting some one-on-one times with these newly elected member uh, ministers, but also some one-on-one time with the new premier of the province? Oh, absolutely. And the, the premier is committed to uh, speaking at our event, and he's also committed to hosting our uh, bear pit session, which is always quite entertaining now that, you know, we're going to have a new government in place. It's not the same old, same old uh, questions that it might be a little more, entertaining and revitalizing to to be a part of it because you're going to see how the new ministers deal with things firsthand only after being elected into the position for three months well i appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule to do this i know you are at the legislature right now but before we go i just have to ask one last question and that is what's next what's next for the association what's next for you heading into this fall term i know you have your upcoming session as we uh, your upcoming conference but what do you see as your next priority with this government he is building relationships you know we have to show them that we are one association that are willing to work together with them and not against them. We want a strong Manitoba and our organization is committed to doing that. In a country where municipal, in a country where municipal politics is often being characterized by independent candidates vying for council seats, the prospect of introducing political parties into the mix has sparked a heated debate here in the province of Alberta. Canada is one of the last countries, not only in the Commonwealth, but in the G7 nations, who has no political parties municipally. Now, the clash of opinions comes against the backdrop of the province's recent initiative to reevaluate municipal elections, among other things. In a bid to gather public input, two surveys were launched by the province earlier this month with a focus on scrutinizing the dynamics of local elections. Albertans have been urged to actively participate in the two surveys, each estimated to take between 10 to 15 minutes each. Now, a recent survey conducted by renowned Calgary pollster Janet Brown on behalf of Alberta municipalities adds an intriguing layer to the ongoing discourse. The survey revealed that 68% of respondents expressed a preference for municipal candidates to continue running as independent individuals, rather than affiliating with political parties. Conversely, 24% of respondents favored a shift towards candidates running under the banner of political parties. Now, as this debate intensifies, it remains to be seen how the public stands, as reflected in these surveys, will influence the future landscape of municipal elections across Alberta. 
We sat down with two former candidates in Calgary, both on opposing sides of this municipal debate. Rob Ward, who contested in Ward 11 against now Councillor Courtney Penner, staunchly opposes the introduction of political parties at the municipal level. While Mike Lavallee, who ran in Ward 12 against now Councillor Evan Spencer, stands in favor of this potential change. Here's our interview with Rob Ward. Rob, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I, I want to start with sort of an overarching question to get into the meat and potatoes of the uh, the conversation, and that is, why are you so opposed for political parties to be introduced at the municipal level here in the province of Alberta? I think the biggest thing is that it just it doesn't allow the elected officials to represent their constituents or the residents of the ward so much as it does the party's interests itself. Uh, I think especially in a municipal election, when people are choosing who to vote for, they're looking for somebody that's, you know, kind of connected to the community that has the community's interests at heart rather than, say, somebody with a certain party. Um, and I, I think it just it, it doesn't give you that sort of I don't know if personal touch is the right word, but that connection to the community. I, th I think people would see the person as more connected to the party as opposed to the community. That, that's my biggest reason, I would say. Now, you ran in 2021 in the city of Calgary, and uh, you you came second. Um, I, I've got to sort of ask the sort of honest follow-up question to your opposition. Would you be opposed if you had won and people said, oh, you're for a party, so we're going to vote for you? But since you lost, are you just opposed because it might bring someone else to the forefront? And if you're thinking about running two years from now, it would give you a better chance as an independent compared to being a party candidate. I, to be completely honest, I think that uh, if there was parties in the next election, I, I would probably be picked to represent a party. And I just don't think that's a good thing. I honestly don't. I mean, it, it definitely adds credibility to a candidate. And I would say that was one of my biggest struggles was people didn't really know who I was. Uh, people in my local community might have, but most people had no idea who Rob Ward was. And so, yeah, it can add credibility. But then again, as I said, it also adds that uh, seed of doubt. Is this guy really in it for the ward, for the community, or is he just doing it for the party so yeah it can add that legitimacy to somebody's name but i i personally just don't see the benefit i i wouldn't want to be part of it when you were out door knocking in the last election did you hear people ask those questions to you what party do you oh, represent yeah. so is oh, there yeah. <laughs> so let's i want to pick up on that for a little bit here is there a misunderstanding that there's already party politics involved in the municipal level and this move potentially might just be putting a name on something that's already sort of ingrained in people's minds do you think yeah i mean uh, without getting too ranty here i mean that was that was do probably it, one do of the... it because you need oh, to, you want the me show. to go do you <laughs> uh, i can go um the uh the yeah i got that question a lot i got two questions a lot one who are you voting for mayor and two uh it was always worded differently but the most common one was what are you and I'm like, well, what do you mean? I'm raw board. What What do you mean? And they'd say, well, are you conservative? Or are you like an NDP supporter? Or, and I said, well, I'm neither, really. I mean, I, I can tell you what I'm about. I'm not, I'm not like either of those, to be completely honest. And I wouldn't call myself a centrist either. Uh, I, I have different opinions on different topics. So what, what is important to you? And I can tell you where I stand on it. Um, I, I don't think that people perceive there to already be parties now there is groups that kind of have made parties i mean we have your union-backed groups your calgary's future group and that's basically a party and then you have the uh you know take back city hall group which is basically another party that uh continues to flop on its face every time it tries to do something uh they got what one person uh you could call one and a half i don't think that mr chabot was really tied in with them but yeah, it, it just doesn't work. I, the And I think the big push from people is, it. I, I'd say it's mainly more from the conservative side to organize a party. Uh, I think that's the whole reason this was voted on at the UCP AGM is 
the conservatives want this, but the conservatives need to realize that it's not going to work. I mean, it's already been tried and it's failed miserably. Uh, one candidate elected, uh, Dan McLean, is, is that's not success. I'm sorry. It just it's not going to work. Some advocates would be saying that this is just leveling the playing field. You, you talked about those union backed uh, Progress Calgary or Unity Calgary. I forget the names of the organizations right now who came out yeah. and endorsed. I, I'm using air quotes there for those who are listening, endorsed <laughs> candidates and moving to a political party would just level the playing field against those uh, organizations, those third party organizations who are backing candidates, putting their name to the candidates and having them run in the election. Why do you see leveling the playing field? And I'm just playing devil's advocate with you here yeah. for a second, Rob. Why do you yeah. see them leveling the playing field as a bad thing? Or would you be in more in favor of stopping that sort of third party entrance into municipal politics that we saw in the 2021 election. Yeah. Yeah. You, you nailed it. I, <laughs> I, I would rather have no third party involvement at all. I mean, you know, here's another rant for you. The problem with the, uh, the way that Calgary's future, that's the group that was running their sort of union funded slate. Uh, the problem with that is, People are paying their union dues and and expecting their union dues to go towards protecting their rights, getting better wages, uh, negotiation to to have a union act upon their behalf to negotiate a better work contract. And instead, well, not all of it, but some of it is going towards endorsing political candidates. And I talked to a lot of employees that are in this union. I actually did sort of an informal survey. I'm not going to call it scientific by any means, but an informal survey, and a lot of them didn't the, the majority and and a large majority didn't know that their money was going to Calgary's future and when i explained what it was and what they were doing they were even more opposed to it so it i i find that wrong i also and and there's other third party advertisers it happened to me i was endorsed by a third party advertiser i had no idea i had never talked to them i had no idea i even contacted the guy that was running it and said hey can you stop running ads with my name on them i i don't i don't want it i don't need it like just drop it they wouldn't do it so now i've got somebody endorsing me and and it could be used the other way right it could be like a kamikaze thing like you get this you know psychopath third party advertiser that wants to sewer you and they start advertising for you it's like yeah like this you know super alt alt-right group is now going to endorse you i don't want that so yeah it's i just think if we can get rid of all the exterior noise and third-party advertisers i think that's only a good thing i just it, it should be about the people and, and donations should be collected from people that that's how i feel I, I again i see the benefits and 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 i'll tell you the people that want you know more outside influence and more party organization it's not so much the candidates, it's the organizers, because for some people, this is how they make a living is organizing political third party action committees or third party groups to to corral a group of uh, candidates together. And, oh, we're going to help you out by doing this, doing that. And then they just take a cut on the side. And uh, and some of them are really bad at it because they don't get good results. So, like, um, yeah, le less would be good. Advocates would be pointing to Vancouver, Victoria, Ma Lower Mainland sure. BC, Montreal, who see political parties at the municipal level. Um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at w what the organizational look looks like down there or in yeah. those municipalities where they do have political parties. But do you see it as a negative when you look at those uh, municipalities who do have that and see the partisanship that's sort of being ingrained into their city councils? Because I watch them from time mm -hmm. to time, and I've had a few of them on the show. <laughs> and I can tell you, it is basically like I'm watching Queens Park or um, the yeah. Alberta legislature or even the House of Commons question exactly. period because no yeah. one wants to talk. Do you do you have an issue with partisan politics being adapt it into the council table not even talking about elections but the council table as well yeah i mean chris you, you sit and watch council meetings i would have never guessed that 
Man, that's me. Cool. <laughs> oh, I, I got a lot of a time to spare while I'm sitting at the hospital, Rob. So yes, that's what I do. Uh, that's one way to pass the time. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the problem, you know, you look at these other cities that have gone to party politics. I, I look mainly at, say, Vancouver, Montreal, and I, I, I use one measure that, in my opinion, tells you the success of that route. Uh, one of the biggest problems with the municipal election is voter turnout, voter, ap voter apathy, uh, just general belief that their vote makes a difference. And if you look at those cities, the vote turnout is, it hasn't gone up. And if anything, you would think that having party politics would add clarity for people and they'd really want, you know, my team versus the team I don't like. And it would encourage them to get out to vote. It hasn't done that. So for that reason, I just don't think it's achieving the goal that people think it is. And then when you talk about, you know, actual debate within chambers, um, yeah, again, again, you're, you're at least from a resident's viewpoint, I would say, you know, now you're seeing they care more about the party than they do the residents of their community. And and you're right. It's dead on. It's just like watching a, a provincial debate. It's you, you kind of know, like, why are we even debating this? We all know what the vote's going to be like. <laughs> what a waste of time. So, yeah, it just I just don't see any concrete benefits for the constituents it's more for the you know the the politicians and their organizers that's who's benefiting most from this in my opinion so i, I i'm gonna sort of paint you with a broad stroke here and tell me if i'm out of line by doing it but i can imagine and i'm going to imagine that you are more on the right of the political spectrum when it comes to sort of partisanship and your viewpoint you say you're not centrist i'm assuming you are not left of center in our no. conversations that you and i have had um you mentioned at the top of the interview that um, this is aimed at that conservative base of Daniel Smith. And you're right. We saw this at the past at the UCP AGM. So I, I've gone to ask because I'm assuming you've talked to members of the United Conservative Party. You chat with people in the conservative side of the spectrum as well, and potentially people across mm -hmm. the spectrum. What are you hearing from people? Are they iffy on this? Are you, people even hearing about this issue because i can tell you unless you're a municipal counselor or someone who watches municipal politics like i do no one's talking about this issue no again it's it's just like i said the people that are talking about this issue are the people that are elected officials and organizers that's it people generally don't i mean I, i've talked to people from both sides i'm actually kind of lucky that way people from both sides kind of will talk to me because you know, I have opinions on things, but I like to hear both sides of it because I think it just educates you. But yeah, the only people that I have experienced that are truly pushing for this, probably the most are the organizers, the third party advertisers and stuff like that. Uh, you're right. There is no need for this. And we, and we saw that in the vote, even at the UCP AGM and even in Janet Brown's polling, um, the majority of people don't want party politics in municipal politics because what's the benefit it just it seems like poor representation for constituents hypothetically this passes this the survey comes back which the alberta government is pushing um this comes and it shows that people do want it yet again we should never believe a survey that is conducted by a government because let's be honest <laughs> only the people who are actively engaged are filling it out the majority of people are not okay. and that's just my personal right. opinion no you're right do you think the next municipal election here in the city of Calgary could be worse than what we saw in 2021 with the partisanship with those third party candidates, third party organizations coming out of the woodworks. And we could see instead of three or four major ones, 20 or 30 major ones. Oh God, I hope not. Um... <laughs> because trust me, I don't want another 26 mayoral ballot in the 2024 no, no, election. No, no, that's, no. that's just Chris Brown saying that right now. I well, a couple of things there. I, I, I'm fairly confident in saying that we won't see any major changes for the next election in terms of uh, the Municipal Government Act or anything like that, or the Local Elections Act. There, there, nothing's going to change. There's not going to be parties. So I, I, I will put good money on that. Um, in, in terms of, yeah, are we going to see? 30 candidates again. I, I, I've talked to a lot of people about this, and I think the 2021 election was quite unique. You know, we were in the middle of a pandemic. Um, 
people's circumstances were quite different than they are normally. A lot of people might have been unemployed. They might have been, let's be honest, bored. And so they thought, ah, what the hell? Swing the bat. Let's give it a try, right? So I I just don't think there'll be that many people running again. Um, things are a bit more normal now. <laughs> so, yeah. We're putting I, this I, on I the record so. right here, right now. I, I'm going to come back to you in two <laughs> years and either throw it in your face or you're going to throw it in my face. Um, I have to ask one last question before I let you go here. And that is, have you filled out the surveys? So the, the two surveys at the provincial government and you went through it. Was there anything in those surveys that kind of stood out to you besides the political parties aspect of the changes that the government is looking at when it comes to the local elections authority act and the code of conducts of the uh, councillors? Yeah, I to be honest, Chris, I don't remember too much of it, but the uh you filled it out, took yeah. ten minutes, and you're good. <laughs> exactly. I did notice uh, some pretty horrible grammar on one question. I do remember that, but <laughs> um, yeah, I. It, but you it's filled all... it out, though. Do you know other people oh, yeah. who are filling it out as well, or again, it's just those organizers. I mean... I passed it on to my politically inclined friends, people who care about that kind of stuff, which is not many people, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just when I look at something like that, to me, it's, oh, this might get me in trouble. But I, I just think that it's political pandering, just like the recall legislation that Jason Kenney passed. That is just scoring cheap political points uh, to actually pull off a, re a successful recall is just nearly impossible you would have to have the most organized army of all time it, it's just not realistic but hey the politician can say look i did it i did it i don't know it's meaningless dribble in my opinion now our interview with mike lavalley Mike, greatly appreciate it for sitting down with me today. Um, I want to start with a general question, and it's the reason why you are here. Uh, you are, well, you have publicly said to me, and now publicly saying it on the show, that you are in favor of the introduction of political parties at the municipal level. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the, uh, the interview, I've got to sort of ask the sort of million dollar question is why? Why do you believe that political parties at the municipal level is a benefit to our municipal system? Really, I think the biggest thing for myself is that it would add transparency. Um, so many times now, uh, when people are voting on a municipal candidate, they might not have a really good understanding of some of that candidate's basic ideas or leanings as far as the political spectrum. And, 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 it's, e and it's easy for somebody to kind of wash over the question a little bit. You know, geez, I'm in the middle. How many times have you heard this? You know, mostly in the middle. You know, I, 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 I like this, but I also support that. And that is the standard type of answer that comes out with municipal candidates. And, and I think that if, if candidates sort of identified themselves, you know, as being associated with the party, that would really help voters add some transparency as to, and give them a general understanding about maybe some of the basic ideas uh, about where that candidate's coming from. Now, in 2021, you ran for city council in Ward 12 in the city of Calgary. Um, yeah. I've got to sort of ask a very sensitive uh, question, but I, we're friends, so I, I, I don't feel embarrassed <laughs> asking this question because I asked it as a person who is in favor of or not in favor of political parties. Are you in favor of political parties because you believe that if the system was there, you would have won the last election? Or were you hearing things at the door when people when you were approaching people saying what political party are you for what is this basis based on is it just like you said that transparency aspect or is there an underlying issue that it's more personal and you want to potentially win if you decide to run in two years i don't think it would have made that much of a difference um in terms of my own personal situation that's really really tough you know Anytime there's an election happens and somebody wins or doesn't win, it, it's pretty tough to peg that on any one issue or one type of thing, unless somebody really steps in it and do, does a bad job. But um, no, I, I think 
when I was out talking to people, and it was a bit of a limited talk because we were in the middle of COVID um, during during that election campaign. So face to face time was was more difficult than it certainly would be today. But I I, I got asked the question a lot. Well, you know, what political party are you with? Um, you know, you know, are you conservative? Are are you liberal? Are you NDP? Um, that question came up a lot, and it, and it kind of speaks to some of the general population's misunderstanding of the way that the system works at the three different levels, and how there is currently a difference in the at the municipal level as compared to the. Um, provincial or, or federal levels of politics. So uh, that was a question that got answered. And if I heard it a whole lot, I'm sure other candidates heard it a lot when they were out speaking to people too. So you, you, you really developed an answer about, well, geez, it doesn't work that way. And you know, the people ask the question, when you describe to them how it works, they kind of look confused. You know, it, it, it wasn't what they were kind of, kind of expecting or or, or wanting to hear. So it, it, it was something that that I did hear a lot um, during the campaign. And, and I think it would have led to some transparency. Would it have changed results in the election? No idea. Um, impossible to tell. In future elections, would it, would it lend transparency? Absolutely, I think so. Um, I, I don't see how it couldn't actually. One of the big things that oh, I, I recently, actually, I should start this question again. I, I recently spoke with Rick McIver, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, and he said that partisan politics is already, it basically uh, it, uh, underlining that partisan politics is already there in municipal government, in politics. We saw in the last municipal election here in the city of Calgary that there was third party organizations endorsing candidates, backing candidates with uh, financial money. Are you saying that transparency aspect, it's kind of leveling the field that, yes, there's going to be third parties who are going to be endorsing candidates, but if you have a party it's already leveling the field against those third party organizations who are trying to boast one candidate over another. Yeah, I think certainly it's going to lend transparency. If you, if, and if you look at the last election, there was one very large third party advertiser um, for, for the, uh, the, the civic election in Calgary. Um, it was millions of dollars. It was well over, I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but they were the single largest um, group in terms of funds put forth to promoting candidates. And I've heard one figure, and I don't know if it's exactly right, but they spent on their candidates more than all of the candidates combined spent on themselves. So they certainly had a large impact on there. And that figure might not be exactly right. It could be plus or minus a little bit. So I'm more than willing to be fact-checked on that one. But For those uh, who are listening, fact-check away because we'd have yeah, to have no, that. Yeah, hit Google and see if you can find it. it, it you got to dig deep and do some math. But um, yeah, you, you can find it there. Um, but yeah, but at a lot of the but a lot of the voting public didn't really know that. So you had a group with a large pool of funds well, and they did everything properly. It was well within the uh, Elections Act. There was nothing that, that was wrong or illegal with any of the promotion they did. But I think very a very small percentage of the of the voting public actually realized how big an impact they had and how and how much money was being spent and how they were leaning towards sort of a group of their selected candidates and and in the case of the Calgary election where we had this group with this large pool of money it wasn't that it was kind of a non-biased pool of money um you know a lot of the objections to having party uh, party politics at the civic level is that, you know, geez, we don't want it to be, you know, this money coming from here and this money from here. But, well, it already is. Um, that third party advertiser was, was the, the funds were gained from the unions. 
um, unions that uh, had members for the, the city of Calgary. And the chief organizer was a past president of a riding association for the NDP. So pretty tough to say that they weren't biased um, in their leanings. And there was, as much as they did everything properly, I think there was very little transparency or maybe they, they did the transparency properly, but there was very little awareness in the general public and the voting population that that was the situation that existed. So I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you here, Mike, and I want to Perfect. sort of pose the question. Um, the, the the thing that I hear when I talk to people who are against the move to partisan politics at the municipal level is you lose that community minded uh, counselor who is supposed to look after all of the community and not just one political party and political parties being introduced would be tied to the political party's organization and not the community's organization. How do you rebut that from a political standpoint to say, you know what, that's not the case. What do you say to people who, like myself, are asking you that if we move to the partisanship, councillors, mayors are going to be beholden to the organizers rather than the community? A couple of questions to come back with it, but um, the the first thing is that, well, if you're electing a good candidate, that candidate is going to be very self-concerned with, with wanting to um, serve everybody in, in the case of Calgary in their ward, uh, the electoral district for the municipal election. A good candidate's going to do that. Uh, the first thing they're going to say after the election is they're going to recognize what percentage of the vote they got. And yes, I won or the election, but it's my duty to represent all of you. How can I bring our community together and how can I listen to your concerns and push those forward? So if you have the right candidate, it's not an issue whatsoever. Um, the other thing is that the with the bias, some of the biases that aren't as obvious now, um, and as much as we don't have, you know, we don't have a political party system, it is incredibly obvious, and it has been for the last several terms at the city of Calgary, that we have groups of councillors that vote together and, and support each other and, and, and lean a certain direction, whether it be one way or the other, either left or right. It's That was a, a big topic uh, when we were discussing mayoral candidates uh, in the last uh, civic election in Calgary is that, well, this person always voted this way or they were always against this group of people or that sort of thing. So that is already happening. The 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 kind of gathering their votes and where you have a group of councillors that are tending to promote the same ideas, support each other, um, not present their their own arguments or ideas or their own motions uh, to challenge those sort of things. That's been happening for terms, several terms, at least going back in my memory anyway. Um, so it's happening now. If it's happening now, maybe we should just be more transparent about it. Uh, you look across Canada and traditionally municipal elections or municipal councils are nonpartisan, except Vancouver, Lower Mainland, BC, uh, Montreal. Um, I, I, you're, I'm assuming you're not like me and you're not sitting down every night and watching council meetings because I'm a nerd like that. And that's what I do on a daily basis. But if you do do what I do and you watch these uh, municipal council meetings and you see the partisanship, do you have any concern, if not, uh, then good, of seeing what we see in the Alberta legislature at the House of Commons being introduced? And it's more of a confrontational council than a working together council. Or as you've just said, are you already seeing that? It's just we're putting labels on it. Fine. You're already seeing that. Um, as far as confrontational councils, Look at all of the, if you look back to not our current council, um, if you look back to some of the criticisms of the past council previous to uh, 2021, um, and there was many, many media lines written about and observations made about how confrontational 
the council was. And if you look at where we've been going and because the council is very new, there's a large turnover in a number of councillors um, during this term. It, it's taken a while to sort of generate momentum and steam, but we're starting to see it already with you know two or three, maybe four councillors that tend to think one way, the rest that think another way, and they are already starting to be at odds. If you look at some of the um, uh, comments that were made uh, and the way the voting went uh, in the, this past budget evaluation week for the um, at the city of Calgary, it, it, it's pretty obvious that th those at odds types of thing, types of groups on council are there already. Um, the my challenge, if I were to issue one, to to existing councillors is a hey you're not there under officially under a party system uh, supposedly you don't have any allegiances to each other but it seems like you're acting that way are you really acting in the best interests of the people in your ward or are you going along with somebody else on council because you think you have similar ideas I uh, the survey is open until December sixth. Uh, I have had the pleasure to sit down and fill out the survey. Uh, I, prior to this, uh, I, I asked you had you and you said you were going to. I just want to double check that you had you had finished it. Good. Um, looking at the two surveys that were presented in front of Albertans, was there anything that popped out at you during your filling that survey those surveys out that you said okay I'm, I'm trying to figure out where the province is going with local elections was there anything of concern to you or was it pretty standard stuff in your mind i think it was pretty standard stuff you have to be very careful with surveys because surveys can be worded and ordered in a certain way to lead results into a direction where the author of the survey wants them to go. Um, a prime example of that is one of my biggest pet peeves about the um, quality or the citizen satisfaction survey that the Calgary, uh, city of Calgary issues on a regular basis. When they do that survey and they do it over the phone, the very first question they ask when you pick up the phone, because I've gotten the survey a couple of times from the city of Calgary and they haven't changed it. Um, they ask if they're speaking to the youngest person in the household of voting age. So if I have a 20-year-old um, son living at home, they would be asking to speak with him. My, In my opinion, that survey is now biased because you're probably talking to the person who's not paying the property taxes at home. So asking them a whole lot of questions about the effectiveness of the tax dollars really isn't very genuine when you do that survey. So to circle back to what to your question is that, yeah, it's very obvious sometimes when surveys are trying to lead you down a certain path. Um, I didn't see a lot of that in, in the two surveys um, currently out there. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, deadline is December 6th on them. Um, one thing really leapt out at me in the surveys, and it was in the second one, on the uh, the code of conduct, conduct, and you know, with counselors and and mayors and that, and it, it it's it's I think something that a lot of people don't realize. And the survey, if people take it, um, might sort of start to realize. So, it, it talked about disqualification of candidates and. and what would be the grounds for disqualifying a candidate? And it, and it lists some of the things in the survey that would disqualify a, a, a candidate from their job, basically get them fired from their job where the province could remove them. And under the current system, if you've ever been in violation, even small, if you've been found to be in violation of the uh, Elections Act in Alberta, you don't qualify for a period of 10 years before you can run as a candidate again. So for example, if there was somebody that ran in the last civic election for Calgary and didn't file their paperwork on time with their donations, didn't follow all the rules, somehow violated something in the election, even if it's a small violation, 
part of the penalty, it might be a small fine of 50 or $200, but part of that penalty is now you are disqualified from being a candidate in the next election when you read the act. The ironic part of the way the act is right now and the way it works is that, okay, if you had a violation of some sort in terms, maybe it was with regards to campaign financing in the last election. And the election is in, you filed your paperwork, they looked at it, somebody looked at it and said, well, hey, you were in violation here during this, or a, a complaint was filed after the election. You could be in violation of the act, but that doesn't disqualify you from continuing to be a counselor or the mayor for your current position. You might not qualify to be a candidate when it comes up time for re-election, but you get to keep your job for four years. Yeah. So there's a question about that on the survey where if if you're found in, you know, what would disqualify a candidate? And it talks about the act a little bit and they're thinking about making a revision. I think that would be an excellent revision because if somebody won, in theory, they probably did it partially because they were in violation of the act. There's only one reason why you would violate the act or two reasons. You didn't know. Could be an honest mistake, right? Or you were trying to do your best to get more votes and manipulate the system, you know, go through the gray areas, push the boundaries to win the election. And if you did that and crossed the line, should you get to keep your job? I think no is the answer to that. Currently, the answer is yes, legally in the province of Alberta, you do get to keep your job. So that was one of the questions on the survey that really leapt out at me as being, well, this is a no brainer. Why isn't this implemented right away? But we'll wait and see what people have to say about it, I guess. Uh, just to wrap up here, I, I've got to ask a sort of stupid question, but I think it's an important one. Um, as I said, I'm a political nerd. Uh, these type of surveys like perk my interest, particularly when it comes to municipal governance. Are you hearing this talked about from your friends, from your family members? Are people discussing political parties at the municipal level? Or is this such an issue that is not on anyone's radar that the province is doing this in a time when no one's really paying attention? I don't know if they're doing it during a time when nobody's paying attention, but as far as the general public, nobody's paying attention. Uh, and I don't know if it's a particular timing issue. I don't think that is necessarily at fault. I, I just don't think that there's a general awareness of the surveys and some of the planned changes that are going to happen and, and what their impacts may be because people aren't talking about it. Uh, I've brought it up with a few people in my circle of acquaintances. Nobody was aware. Nobody had any idea whatsoever. Uh, the people that that are aware of it and know about it are people with a keen interest in politics, um, like yourself, people that have run before, people that plan on running again, people who run campaigns and manage campaigns for candidates. They're all aware of it. The people within that the industry of politics, we'll say, uh, are aware of it in, in Alberta. But outside of that, I think it's extremely small in, in the in the awareness and unfortunately we're coming up to the deadline within, within a couple of weeks i i think it would be well served um by the provincial government to to do a bit of a marketing campaign and say hey this is something that we're looking at provide your feedback here just you know whether it be through social media the, you know a, a public service tv or radio spot um just to kind of raise some of that awareness because the people I have floated it to and and who are actually and I ask them because they tend to follow civil politics a little bit. They have more of an interest in it. And there was no awareness whatsoever. So um, I don't know if it's a timing issue, but um, I think in terms of serving, doing themselves a better service and providing more, I guess, credibility to the results of the survey, it, it wouldn't hurt to to increase awareness it's quiet week this week for by-elections only one municipality in the province of alberta headed to the polls with the village of hellkirk being that municipality 
of the five people running for the three municipal council seats in the village, Dennis Cordell, who previously served on council before retiring, Ross Elseler, a former councillor and village mayor, and Jan Codart have all been voted in. The village has been under provincial administration since earlier this year when a majority of the village council resigned. Upcoming by-elections this week include the town of Slave Lake, Alberta, on November 28th, where three candidates are vying for one position. And in Ontario, Canada's largest municipality will be heading to the polls on November 30th. Ward 20 residents will be electing a new councillor. The former councillor resigned his seat earlier this fall. Heading into December, on December 13th, voters in Ward 9 in Mackenzie County will be heading to the polls to elect a new councillor. And in Morden, Manitoba, they will be heading to the polls to elect a new mayor and council member on December 20th. Three more resignations were brought forward to our attention this week. In the District of Hudson Hope, Councillor Kelly Miller resigned in October, and according to a news release by the District Mayor, Travis Corbell, said that the by-election is expected to be scheduled in 2024. Also in British Columbia, the town of Creston, Councillor Anthony Mondea resigned his position on council on November 20th. This is the second resignation for the town of Creston Council in the past two months. The CAO of the council in a media report from Creston Valley Advance said the by-elections for the two council vacancies will take place in the first quarter of 2024. Veteran politician Jack Anawak has resigned from Iqaluit City Council less than a week after he was sworn in from the Nunavut municipal elections. The former MP and Nunavut cabinet minister was elected to city council on October 23rd. Of the eight elected councillors, he received the fewest votes. According to Elections Nunavut, it is up to the city of Iqaluit to fill the vacancy left by the former councillor. Now, according to last month's election results, Lewis Faulkner McKay was the candidate with the most votes who did not gain a seat on council. No word about the filling of that vacancy as of publication. Remember, if you have any council resignations or upcoming council by-elections, be sure to send them over to us so we can keep track on what is going on municipally across Canada. And that's all for Municipal Affairs Report for November 27th, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched today's episode. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do that without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, your municipal concerns, and even, yes, your municipal triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential to that mission, and we're here to amplify them. Until next Monday, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Thank you.